where that conflict, that battlefield, is the human body, where all the forces of light and darkness eventually begin to face each other. So the final hour here, now, giving this frivolous kind of insertion, we could speak that the second coming of Christ is the internal affair. This is the so-called last judgment, not in terms of the outer events, but what we experience in terms of internal affair when we are faced with this, what creates that polarization out of necessity and pulls us, propels us simultaneously in both directions. And that's what the process of awakening really heralds. So we left it with Andrei Balkonsky lying on the battlefield and having this encounter, this brief encounter with Napoleon de Bonaparte. It's interesting that uh, Ridley Scott just movie just came out, right? Napoleon. Um, I mean, Ridley Scott's cinematography is always very interesting. I'm always looking forward to see his movies, and there are a lot of already conflicting uh, feedback, critical assessments. Many, many people feel it's a flop or it's a like complete failure. Um, I mean, the subject itself, you know, tackling the figure of Napoleon, which is a historical figure, which has, which is very problematic, controversial, and written with a lot of, of course, that heavy historical baggage. But to his defense, he was emphasizing that his main incentive was to show Napoleon and his relationship as a private man, to give that zoom in perspective onto the man himself, right? Played by this actor, Johan, what was him? Yeah, I never can pronounce his name. He's a brilliant, dramatic actor. He's kind of like also, he has this, uh, that method actor, um, uh, like, approach, right? And I don't know whether he at all has had in view Tolstoy's War and Peace, because that's also uh, emphasizes that personal point of view, several personal points of views, juxtaposed, often contrasting to that universal, as if God's eye point of view, as the history unfolds, as this whole particularly campaign of Napoleon in Russia unfolds and how it impacts all the characters, what they undergo, and disillusionment, and the, because the ideas of Napoleon were viewed as uh, literally on have been mentioned on par with the Alexander the Great's conquest of Asia, right? Some of you may remember that it was considered to be unique, at least that's how the Western scholars always presented that, and I'm not here to dispute that, um, because I was fascinated by it myself. Alexander the Great had a tutor, had a mentor in Aristoteles, and Aristoteles, encompassed in himself, um, arguably, uh, let's say, the fruits of ancient Greek thought. With Aristoteles, we have the birth of dialectical materialism. With Aristoteles, without Aristoteles, in fact, there is no uh, Karl Marx. Without Aristoteles, there is no development of thought towards what would be entertained as the alternative possibility for social structure that socialism and communism was viewed because it's all rooted. This is where these uh, thinkers, philosophers, and social um, um, reformers 
were drawing the inspiration. So Aristotle is greatly influenced Alexander the Great. Apparently, he was the only, he, uh, purportedly, uh, Aristotle was the only man to whom Alexander actually listened. The only man. He actually listened to him, though we know that he was very, very charismatic, completely self-reliant, this. In Indian spirituality, Alexander the Great has the statue of this, what they speak of, as this very special incarnation of beings who are here to change the course of history. And there's the concept of avatars, right? These incarnations of divine principles. Mostly Vishnu, because the Vishnu is the principle responsible for preservation, sustenance. Very rare that of Brahma, the creator. Just as a footnote, the crash course, let's say, in Hinduism, with its basis in Vedic culture, if you go to India, what you would find peculiar is that you would hardly find any temples dedicated to Brahma, the creator. Although in that um, trinity of Murti, right, the, where the three gods are portrayed, the creator, the sustainer, and the destroyer, right, and exemplified in that Hindu, Brahma, Vishnu, Shiva, right? Brahma doesn't have that much of a following. Reasons for that are peculiar, reasons for that are interesting. See, Brahma needs to be subdued because he represents the unstoppable force of that, what creation here is exemplified with all the wilderness, with all the unpredictability. The study of, for example, of one of the Vedic disciplines known as Vastu, Purusha Mandala, sorry, Vastu per se, is inseparable from the Vastu Purusha Mandala greed. And the greed, which serves as the blueprint for all structures, for all buildings to be erected, be it a temple or a place for dwelling. It is utilized and it is, consists of a representation of the body of Brahma with the greed superimposed on top so as to confine unconfinable aspect responsible for creation so as to give the possibility to articulating, confining that what otherwise is unconfinable. You see? So, but there is no worship of Brahma. There is no temples dedicated to Brahma. Maybe some, somewhere, in, in, but the majority of temples in India are dedicated to Vishnu and Shiva. Shiva temples are plenty, and likewise Vishnu. So therefore it is spoken of as two principal veins there, Vaishnavites and Shaivites. Anyway, so just simply to bring that in this, um, to somehow to tie it in with what we have spoken here. So the beings of Alexander the Grey and likewise someone like Napoleon had carried this what need to be fulfilled somehow, some kind of achievements which is beyond the possibility of mere mortal, which is beyond the capability of a human being. It, the task is way too, uh, let's say, overwhelming just to have this, what every human being otherwise is an expression of and confronted with, capable of doing. It's like as if divine forces are working through these beings. We can, of course, challenge that view. We can look into this, but that is a perspective. Ramana Maharshi, when he was told about the Second World War, purportedly remarked to the dismay of those who were around, the dismay of the Westerners, 
when he was told about the atrocities of the Second World War committed by the Nazi, he just said, well, who knows, perhaps Hitler is in abbotthood. Just like that. Like the incarnation of some kind of divine powers to bring some kind of transformations into society. You see? So, of course, this was uh, excused. This was explained on behalf of Ramana that he was uneducated, just a village boy, effectively speaking, who never really, you know, went through any kind of like his knowledge of the Western culture was next to whatever he would draw from the newspapers as a, you know, growing up in the British Raj. So he was excused for making that kind of pronouncement. So going back to Napoleon, this uh, ideas of French Revolution, major transformation to society, which heralded the shift towards Republic in France. But of course, we know that Napoleon usurped this. He took it all into his own power. He became the emperor. So very quickly, within lifetime of one single being, all that, what was considered to be as the ideas of freedom, ideas of another qualitatively different society, is being usurped completely by a single person to reestablish himself as nothing, as the emperor. There was a coronation, the famous paintings. If you go to the Louvre in Paris, there are several paintings by famous painters. Jacques-Louis David, for example, the coronation of um, Napoleon the Bonaparte into the emperor of French Empire. See? So, of course, these characters of Leo Tolstoy, they from admiration, and even though they had to fight French as invaders, it was still, it was still accompanied by these very, very peculiar feelings and among the aristocracy, among the, even among the generals, towards the ideas that Napoleon purportedly brings. And the disillusionment, of course, was in the fact that um, as they begin to witness this and that, the unfoldment of what the war is, and this is, this is another reason why it's very hard to pinpoint in terms of the genre what the war and peace is, because some of its pa passages are almost documentary-like, more on par with chronicles. Tolstoy, as a young man, actually served as, as an officer in Sebastopol, on the Black Sea, which was uh, followed by his literally debut, Sebastopol Stories. I don't know if you heard this or not, but where people speak about the birth of the realism in literature. Because he gave the, like, literally the account of that butchery with no gloss, with no veneer, with no kind of like, he just show the nature of the war for what it is. So as a young man, he witnessed that firsthand. So all that experience, because writing about the Napoleonic invasion, he writes about the time before, before he was able to witness that. This is 1812. Now, the year of 1812 is when Napoleon uh, entered Russia with his campaign to conquer it. So this, going back to the scriptures, epics, talked about Ramayana, talked about Ma Mahabharata and that particular part known as the Bhagavad Gita, which Maharishi Mahesh Yogi uh, dubbed as the pocket version of Vedic wisdom. Because it's just a slim part within the greater Mahabharata which describes this events on the Kurukshetra, that battlefield, which is historically exists, it's there, there's a, there's a place, which saw the bloody battle between the two cousins, 
clan of Kuravas and clan of Pandavas, who grew up together in the household of the blind king Dhritarashtra. And one thing led to another, to a major conflict, which resulted in the war, and the bloody war it was. This is why I've mentioned the Peter Brooks Mahabharata, which uh, focuses actually around the Battle of Kurukshetra. The emphasis is made there because that's where the famous dialogue between Arjuna and Krishna takes place. So this juxtaposition on par with paradoxical uh, emphasis on one hand on peace as that Shanta, Shanti, that the greatest concept that came from Indian subcontinent as a culture, as civilization. Things nevertheless are resolved through the military conflict, whether this is Ramayana or whether this is Bhagavad Gita. What this is to draw the, our attention is, of course, there are commentators, I don't know how many of you have heard, that Bhagavad Gita enjoyed more commentaries than any other scripture in, in any other culture. It enjoyed more commentaries throughout its history than any other religious or spiritual work. And of course, there were many commentaries, including the historical ones, done in the 20th century, including that one, the one known to be authored by Maharishi Mahesh Yogi, where the internal dimension of the scripture is being emphasized above all else, <coughs> esoteric dimension. And the polarization here is represented by Pandavas faced with the army of Kuravas, and just for those of you who are not aware, of course, it's very difficult to quickly, compactly put it all into the, just this uh, exposition. But in the course of that dispute, the cousins who grew up together have the same teachers, kicked the ball together as kids, and finally grew in a fine, strong, young man of the warrior caste, Kshatriyas. The, when the, the dispute between them rose, <coughs> and the blind king Dhritarashtra, whose job was to bring five Pandavas as his own sons, it, the promise he gave to the father the, of the sons of Pandu, who had to retreat to the Himalayas because of some karmic set of circumstances forced him to do. So he delegates his five brothers born to Kunti to his brother, blind king Dhritarashtra. Blind king here represents the quality. See? Blind king here represents the quality of our mind, which is blind unless it is enlightened. Blind. And the Bhagavad Gita itself unfolds when Dhritarashtra asks Sanjaya, his adjutant, his uh, <coughs> right-hand man, to outline uh, the landscape of the, ar the the landscape which sees the two armies facing each other. Krishna, who prior to that was just kind of like a friend of the family and a close friend of Arjuna, <coughs> has been given a choice to both the cousins, Kuravas and Pandavas, whether would like, they would like to have his army or he himself. The choice is such that if they will have his army, they cannot have him on their side, that he will be on the side of, of the, he will be on the opposite side, and he will not be involved in a military campaign. He will not fight. So, of course, Kuravas being blinded in the 
incentive as what led in the first place to that conflict. They think, what's the use of the God, even though we know he's God, Blue Krishna, if he's not going to fight? We know his army is mighty. So, of course, without a blink of an eye, they choose an army. And they have a Krishna's army on their side. And Krishna, therefore, takes the side of the Pandavas, and he would serve as the charioteer of Arjuna. And that's where the Bhagavad Gita, the famous dialogue between Lord Krishna and Arjuna will unfold, often referred to by many commentators as the dialogue with the soul, or the self from the lower case, and this self, the dialogue between the soul and the ultimate reality. The dialogue which said to illumine Arjuna and in the meantime outline all the known yogas, all the known path to unity. So each of the unfolding chapters in themselves are called yogas, in fact, starting with the Arjuna Vishada Yoga known as despondency of the Arjuna, because it's the chapter which describes that torment Arjuna experiences when faced with the situation, when he recognizes his gurus, his tutors, well-wishers and relatives are now standing in the opposite side of the army to whom he is there to fight. And overwhelmed with this feeling of discontent and inner conflict, he refuses to fight, sits down, put his ball on the side, and that's where the teaching purportedly begins. This is where the teaching of the Gita unfolds. This is where the Arjuna showed his despondency. He shows here, the soul, as it were, shows the limitations of its autonomy. It shows the limitations of its autonomy. It shows the limitation of knowing what to do, because the conflict that it's experienced is between the mind and the heart. This is the heart of why Indian epics chose the battlefield as the resolution <coughs> where the light and darkness have to face to settle their affairs right, or settle their affairs straight. <coughs> it is that dilemma between the heart and the, and the mind that dilemma between the duty and where the, we feel the pull. Every single one of us are faced with this dilemma at some point in life, many times, until it comes to the resolution, final resolution, which is exemplified by that very dialogue. That very, very dialogue which sees the unfoldment or hears the unfoldment because the Gita translates as the song the Bhagavad Gita, the divine song, is this is what unfolds there and then when Krishna begins to instruct Arjuna. And these instructions incorporate all the known yogas. All the yogas are unfold from there, from yoga of meditation to karma yoga, the yoga of action, to yoga of devotion, to supreme yoga of knowledge. All these yogas are expounded through the chapters of the Bhagavad Gita. And this, what originally leads to that is that conflict. The conflict that Arjuna experiences within when he is placed in a life situation where this polarization took place, where suddenly this has to be resolved through the way of an open conflict. And it will become a very bloody, bloody conf resolution. Like Peter Brook brilliantly managed to convey that through the theatrical means, through these gestures, through these ways of how he, without going through the graphic description of, let's say, Hollywood style of the, mes you know, fighting. It's all done in a theatrical way. Often, no more than two, three, four people in one scene. Very often, 
only a single person there. But in a, it's brought to the, that very, very dramatic way of conveying something which experience deeply, it's intimately, and makes that comparable to how we would act in a given situation, what we will do, how we will respond. And this is the value of these epics, and <clears throat> value what makes them relevant irrespective of the time when they were composed. So they are philosophical treatises made in verse, which deals with the eternal affair of the soul and the spirit, where that conflict, that battlefield, is the human body, where all the forces of light and darkness eventually begin to face each other. So the final hour here, now, giving this frivolous kind of insertion, we could speak that the second coming of Christ is the internal affair. This is the so-called last judgment, not in terms of the outer events, but what we experience in terms of internal affair when we are faced with this, what creates that polarization out of necessity and pulls us, propels us simultaneously in both directions and that's what the process of awakening really heralds. In fact, we spoke about it, at, I don't remember where, I think at the Good Sounds of earlier this year, where we spoke about <coughs> how yoga really is also meant to be understood, that it is through the disunion, the disunion is what leads to union. The separation, before something can be united, it has to be separated. That beating of the butter into a cream to separate the fluid so that cream is the, then can solidify eventually in the final stages of that beating into that hardened substance we know as butter, which further is being clarified in the process of separating yet further that sediment that goes down into the heated pot and what is left is purely clarified butter, ghee, substance which is the carrier of the solar energy, prana, through the conversion of the photosynthesis of turning that grass into the green substance which cow eats and then converts that into the precious beverage known as milk. So the cow here is not just a cow, cow is not an animal. In the Hindu code of understanding, cow is the manifestation of divine mother. So this is why, by the way, those of you who are old enough and may remember when there was this mad cow uh, disease outbreak on a mass level in the UK in 1992, if I'm not mistaken, who, who remembers that here? All right, so we're good, good, feel, feeling good. Don't feel that old, so yeah. In the early 90s, this what, what shook the Tory government, in a way, inability to deal with that uh, cataclysmic event because there were, I don't know exactly, we're not talking about thousands. We're talking about very large number of cows needed to be slaughtered and burned because this was very fast catching to all, the whole livestock. And India offered a United Kingdom to take all diseased cows at no expense to perform this, a huge operation, a huge, huge project of taking these diseased, diseased cows from England to India. Because for many Hindus, this was uh, unbearable, unbelievable to witness. You know, that mechanized slaughter of cows because of, in the first place, a mind-boggling methodology of trying to, you know, they were feed, feeding cows with the offal of the sheep, with the excrements of the sheep. They were adding that because nutritional quality that Mr. whatever, whoever, you know, in his lab came up with 
We can just disperse that stuff. It's full of goodness. Let's feed it to the cows. It will increase the value, and it's also like, you know, this is what the, the, the economists, how they think, how to economize and cut and make profit. So that's what caused, the cause of the mad cow disease was feeding cows with excrements being f fused, mixed into the food chain. So, of course, like this example alone shows you a strength of cultural prevalence where India was willing to spend millions to transport these animals so that they will be saved from that inhumane treatment for being basically paying the price for some kind of economical fiasco, disaster that is. Of course, British government refused that. Are you like, only stupid Indians can come up with something like that. Just, I mean, seriously. <laughs> My God. <laughs> yeah, the parla in the parliament, people actually spoke like that. Like, Madam Speaker, may I say that if we are to allow Indians to transport our mad cows, how does will make, how would that make us look in the eyes of the international communities, and so on. Paraphrasing, just being playful, but I watched it all. Of course, not understanding much. I didn't speak English, it was my first year. Like, ask for translations, just getting by. But it was horrifying, even though I was not at all into any meditation at the time. It was just horrifying views of like, on the news they showed, like they, they had to find a place where and citizens and people were complaining from the ed smoke that was there for weeks on end coming from burnt corpses of cows. I'm not gonna just cut this short. I'm going to tie it beautifully, actually, in this great opportunity which cannot be missed, with something which, I don't know, some of you may think that it's total madness, this whole discourse is here. <laughs> <laughs> but like, it's so tempting. <laughs> Maharishi Mahesh Yogi was actually known for extraordinary gift of being able to translate most complex, most unique Vedic concepts into perfectly accessible to English audiences language. It is very well known that in the early years his discourses were studied with Sanskrit terms which he progressively abandoned, replaced for English equivalent. So by the time when he, let's say, have encountered the Fab Four, who went to see him. As you know, the Beatles made that move. Um, and his discourses were utterly and entirely in English language, speaking to these concepts, translated into English, even ideas that Maharishi used very often. And yet, in the inner circles, among his close associates and disciples, he at times would be known for delivering something which even the strongest and those who knew Maharishi for years would get weak knees. So here is one such story, okay? So at once, at one point, the conversation went around vegetarianism, and Maharishi didn't openly emphasize that, although he wrote that. Those of you who have earlier commentaries on the Bhagavad Gita or the science of living, when you open the very last page, there is a Maharishi's speech in full for a Congress, World's Congress, where he speaks about the importance of vegetarian diet in terms of global uh, sustainability. As simple as that. But he didn't emphasize that because he knew if he will bring this forth, let's say, like Krishna society, right, like ISKCON, he would 
probably uh, have a lot of Westerners that would not be able to ac accept the teachings. So he kind of relaxed that part. But deep inside, he remained the son of India. How could it be otherwise? So in one such conversation, which was related to me from a man who was there, not just Chinese telephone style, this is something which comes from the sources of those who were there. Maharishi told a story, not a story, Maharishi responded to the correlation between beef eating, right, as an industry, and something else. So he said that because of the industrial method of known as meat industry and how many cows are slaughtered, because the nature of the cow's nervous system and what she represents, these slaughtered cows very quickly have to reincarnate as human beings, and they do so, and they become the teachers, mm -hmm. who are basically confused teachers. So the correlation between the meat industry and the proliferation of half-baked, confused teachers. So, of course, man, many people who witnessed that, they were trying to kind of like... <laughs> but this something to reflect on. So that soul of the cow slaughtered and in such way that it will very quickly reincarnate because cow's nervous system and evolution is considered to be very, very high from the point of view of Hinduism. But because the manner with which they and which, which their life been ended, they will reincarnate as those Suda or half-baked teachers. So. <clears throat> so that's Kali Yuga maybe for you. Anyways, so this um, to bring us back to the war and peace again, you see, which prompted Leo Tolstoy to become a vegetarian immediately upon his initiation and introduction into the, into the Vedic thought. It's very well known, very, very well known in, in terms of the, the way you know, it's Tolstoy, Tolstoy, Leo Tolstoy enjoyed tremendous recognition during his lifetime. He was, he enjoyed cult following in Europe, in France in particular, in France, well, in the whole of Europe, even in Italy. And certainly in France, Germany, and England, he was a, this, he had this larger than life status as the greatest writer of his time. And at the beginning of the 20th century, he had his first encounter with the Bhagavad Gita. And the Bhagavad Gita was translated into Russian um, much earlier, much, much earlier. It was translated as early as the beginning of the 19th century, in 18, no, sorry, end of the 18th century by the man known by one, one of the Russian aristocrats, Novikov. Novikov, who was like greatly revered among the Indian uh, scholars. And the connection between Russian culture at, at large and India, whilst it was still thick in the Indian Raj is very well known, very well known. Not only because Russian language is considered to be the closest to Sanskrit, not only that, original Sanskrit. When the first prime minister of India traveled in Soviet Union, it is known that he said, if Panini 
the Sanskrit grammarian was alive, he would be so amazed, he would be so pleased and amazed that Sanskrit is alive at the root cause of all Russian words, of the majority of Russian words, because Russian, of course, geographically, geopolitically being positioned, incorporated many, many Latin words, many, many Latin words, particularly from French and only after that from English languages, but also from German languages. German, French, and English uh, have simply entered with some uh, suffix alteration, right? Revolution, revolution, no? revolution in, in, in it's a French word, Revo revolution, revolution. Свобода на баррикадах, freedom on the barricades. David, Robespierre. So Bhagavad Gita was very well known in Russia, and the Russian Orthodox Church extraordinarily promoted it, promoted it not only allowed it, let alone sham it, it's promoted highly because it speaks to the perennial wisdom. It speaks to the most important affair of what this whole life is about. This was extraordinary time. So the Bhagavad Gita already existed in Russian culture, okay, among the aristocrats and the educated, the intelligentsia, as early as the end of the 18th century break into the 19th century until French Revolution took place and Novikov, who was enjoying the reputation of great reformist, was basically uh, rejected on the, on the uh, suggestion of Catherine the Great who was afraid that these ideas of French Revolution will impact and affect Russia. So many, many intellectuals, many, many aristocrats in Russia who were promoting this were, became persona non grata. So the Bhagavad Gita also enjoyed that same faith. But towards the end of the 19th century, and in the beginning of the 20th century, it became widely available again in many its reprints and translations. <coughs> so when Leo Tolstoy was introduced to the Bhagavad Gita, this is his famous remark that he has never come across of anything more profound. And he was, as you know, fluent in five languages and encyclo with encyclopedic knowledge of what was available at his time about very, very wide variety of topics and subjects. So this is the impact. And then he became Leo Tolstoy. That's, that's how he's known. That's where he became. He stopped shaving in this beard, barefooted, wearing, very simple. He was count by birth, very wealthy. He would be wearing this large, oversized, simple outfits, garments. And that's the kind of like the mature Tolstoy for you, who embraced basically <coughs> Vedic ideas as his very own. And we know that he was considering rewriting the war and peace, or at least writing some kind of uh, an additional work that would give his newly now found faith and a possibility for exposition, for expression. He never did, though. He wasn't, his health and everything <coughs> was already deteriorating, so he was never able to do that. But it would be interesting to speculate now if we are, <coughs> excuse me, if we are to speculate, what would that be? What would that be? In, uh, in a sense, 
of how he would have, thank you, reevaluated the ideas that he has expounded on in the original version of the War and Peace. And I thought to bring this simply as that seemingly meandering, touching various topics here and giving us an opportunity to build maybe a, a larger arc where we can continue addressing and redressing this. So that pool, that pool we also experience under the impact and the influence of social media today in the age of propaganda. We need to be very attentive. Where are we being pulled to? If some of us think that we are remaining neutral, this is where the Samavesha theme comes in. Because it will address the state of affairs when it comes to what we consider ourselves to begin with, how we express ourselves, what interests we have, what takes our fancy from any area, where our aspirations flow. All this is a result, or rather expression of certain qualities, certain qualities that we possess, which in turn, at the deeper level, possesses us. This mutual affair here, what we possess and what possesses us. And this is one of the meanings of the Samavesha. Not one and the only, but one of the meanings, the third one we were meant to address. But in addition to the penetration, which deals more specifically to the entrance of the individual consciousness into universal consciousness as it penetrates, as it were, into the domain of the transcendent, to the Samavesha as immersion. Samavesha as immersion. So these qualities are also impacted and influenced. We are under direct influence when we are exposed to any source of information. And this is what informs us, this is what forms us. So, of course, we can... <clears throat> Many of us prefer to have maybe during the spiritual phase, and it should be acknowledged for, for that as well, the necessity of it. But we cannot completely leave sand, head in sand kind of life. In our day and age, it's impossible. Impractical and impossible. Temporarily, we can go on a diet, on fasting, we can refuse to be exposed to social media, per se, to be exposed to all this. But we will be exposed to that at the energetic level. So we may refuse to partake in any dialogues, conversations, polemics, arguments, but we will be drawn energetically, you see? Because this is what we live. We live at the finale of sorts. We do indeed live at the end of the Western civilization. It is a fact. It's not a fiction. The final frontier is that what has been foreseen by some of the sky, high sky, what is it, sky fi? Sky fi? Sci fi. Sci fi, hi fi, <laughs> sci fi writers and movie makers. You know, that merger between the, this attempt or artificial intelligence merging with biological life, which we, we are. And the process of enlightenment is inseparable from the biology. It's not just a talking school. It's a biological affair. It's the affair which includes endocrine system. It's the affair which includes all the hormone productions. 
the neuroscience today in the 21st century fulfilling that closure of the circle just as quantum physics did in the beginning of the 20th century. So this is where also Tantra becomes so acutely on the ball because it's very, very tantric through and through.